Did you know? It's possible to jump over the flags at the end of the stages in Super Mario Bros. To do this in World 1-1, the player must let a Koopa fall into a pit and then jump over the top of the screen right when it hits the bottom. Because the game treats the bottom and the top of the screen as the same space, Mario will bounce on the Koopa. When it recovers, it will be stuck walking along the bottom of the screen. When the Koopa gets near the castle, the player can bounce on it to go over the flag. Beyond the flag is an infinite expanse of looping tiles. It's also possible to get over the flag in World 3-3 by perfectly timing your jump from the weighted platform at the end of the stage. In the Japanese Super Mario Bros. 2, this glitch became a feature, letting Mario access a warp zone in World 3-1. The warp zone takes Mario back to World 1-1 though, making it more of a trap than a secret. This isn't the only Super Mario Bros. glitch to become a feature. Designer Takashi Tezuka once stated, The concept of the Bowsers in Worlds 1-7 through being regular minions in disguise originally started as a glitch. Presumably, the wrong graphic was loaded in when Bowser was defeated and the team made it part of the story. Perhaps the most well-known bug in Super Mario Bros. is the infinite 1-up trick, where Mario endlessly bounces on a shelled enemy to generate points and lives. A more complicated version of this trick was discovered by Japanese YouTuber Games Higher almost 30 years after the game's release. In two-player mode, if Luigi dies on a vine in World 5-2 when Mario is set to respawn in World 1-2, the vine will spawn next to Mario at the start of the level. The vine can be used to bounce endlessly on the buzzy beetles at the beginning of the stage. This trick can only be done if the game has been beaten already. Interestingly, the glitch also works in the Super Mario All-Stars version of the game. In Super Mario World, dismounting Yoshi to collect a coin with Mario while Yoshi tries to eat the coin will put a null sprite on Yoshi's tongue. The game loads new objects by placing them in one of 11 slots, and this null sprite acts as the first slot available. The player can make Yoshi eat almost anything by loading a new object into the game. If they load a Chuck enemy into the game by being near one when the trick is performed, they'll trick the game into putting a power-up in Mario's inventory based on the type of Chuck Yoshi eats. A clapping Chuck gives Mario a glitched orb from the sunken ghost ship level which Mario can touch to instantly complete any stage. A charging chuck generates a glitched Lakitu cloud which can be used to fly through any stage. Using the cloud in the final boss of the game skips about 30 seconds of Bowser's attacks, making it very useful for speedruns. Since there's nothing at this unmapped location to instruct the console on what to do next, it instead executes the last value in its memory. You can manipulate this value by interacting with sprites in different ways at different coordinates as well as hitting certain certain inputs on the controller. Speedrunners have used this method to start the game's credits in less than a minute, obliterating previous world records. One speedrunner named Master Jun managed to use this exploit to program functioning versions of Snake and Pong into the game. He also changed the ending screen with a custom sprite all in less than three minutes. It's possible to make a similar null object in Super Mario 64 by picking up an object in the last two frames before it disappears. Mario 64 places loaded objects in slots much like the sprite slots in Super Mario World. When an object is unloaded by flickering out of existence or by leaving Mario's draw distance, it's moved to the last slot to be overwritten by the next object that loads in. The object Mario grabs is also moved to the end of the item list and stored in a special slot, a process which takes two frames. If the object is unloaded during those frames, Mario will end up holding a slot that can be overwritten by whatever loads into the game next. This can be anything from coins to chain chomps or even stars. The original object will stay where it is in the world while Mario holds a copy, but if you drop the cloned object, it will replace the original, sometimes with weird results. Using this, YouTuber Panincoke2012 spawns enemies to make bridges that Mario can cross. He does this to complete missions without pressing the A button, or in other words, without jumping. His current 100% run of Super Mario 64 only uses 37 presses of the A button. Individually, 100 of the game's 120 missions can be completed without pressing the A button at all. Meanwhile, hackers and speedrunners are looking for other missions to pursue. Twitch streamer Dota Teabag accidentally warped upwards while trying to land on a platform in TikTok Clock. Other common bugs can instantly change Mario's position like this, but most warp Mario downwards. Only one other glitch can warp Mario upward. It relies on hangable ceilings being above Mario, but there weren't any above Mario when this new upward warping glitch occurred. In order to figure out the cause of this new glitch, Pan and Coke offered a bounty of $1,000 to the first person who could send in a recording of the glitch being replicated in the Moopin64 emulator. As of this recording, that bounty has yet to be claimed. 
by running up and to the right as soon as the first boss fight is over in Luigi's mansion, Luigi can get behind the reward chest before its collision hitbox loads and becomes solid. Using Luigi's vacuum will let the player pop out of bounds between the first and second floors, where they'll now be free to explore the vast sections of the map not previously accessible. From here, the player can reach a spot directly above the final boss room and drop down to complete the entire game in under 15 minutes. If you play Luigi's Mansion normally, you may see something spooky when Luigi is talking to Professor Egad in certain rooms. When the lightning strikes in these scenes, Luigi appears to be dangling several feet from the ground as though he's hanging from a noose. Fans have speculated this means Luigi is already dead during the events of this game and his quest to find Mario is some kind of spiritual journey through the afterlife. However, this chilling effect is just a result of the directional lighting effect being tied to the position of the camera in these rooms. When Egad calls Luigi, the camera pulls in close and low, which puts the light source under Luigi's character model and projects his shadow high up on the wall. Did you know? The Sonic series didn't even get past the first game's title screen without a glitch. The text press start button was supposed to show up in the final game, but doesn't. Sonic Retro user Quickman discovered that this text still exists in the game, but isn't shown due to a programming bug. The Sonic Team Presents screen uses the same chunk of memory as the press start button text, and as the memory isn't cleared properly, press start button doesn't appear. It's possible that the Sonic Team Presents screen was added or modified after the title screen was finished, and the game's code wasn't updated to accommodate the change. The Sonic series went on to have so many glitches that the Sonic 3 instruction book actually referenced them. The manual says these game-ending bugs are Robotnik's diabolical traps, and advises the player to reset their console if they fall into a trap they can't escape from. Glitches also had a large impact on Sonic's early fan community. According to Sonic veteran Yuji Naka, the debug mode was left in Sonic 1 because they felt players would have fun with it. One of the series' more infamous glitches came from this decision. The palette swapped Sonic, dubbed Ashura by fans. To activate the glitch, the player must input both the level select code and the debug mode code, then enter Emerald Hill Zone and rapidly place waterfall sprites. If done correctly, Sonic's palette will change from the familiar blue to green, red, and black hues. This glitch happens because there's limited space in the sprite status table, which stores information about the game's sprites. When enough waterfalls are placed, they exceed the table's memory, and the data spills over into the neighboring palette cache, altering Sonic's colors. The glitch was first discovered by Charles Keegan Mug, who ran a Sonic fan site in the early 90s dedicated to the Japanese games and media. He dubbed the glitch recolor Ashura. While the glitch seems fairly innocuous, it had a huge impact on the Sonic community, with fans attaching themselves to the character and creating art, comics, and fan fiction around Ashura. A similar bug can be found in the Sega 32X game Knuckles Chaotix. By entering the stage select code, the player can pick an unknown character whose name only appears as a series of asterisks. The character uses Knuckles' sprite, but with a garbled color scheme. This character has been dubbed Wecknia by the community, a portmanteau of white and echidna. To explain Wecknia's existence, we need to look back to Knuckles Chaotix's prototype on the Genesis, Sonic Crackers. Crackers lacked the expanded cast of Chaotix, instead starring only Sonic and Tails. As development progressed, the cast and even the console completely changed. However, remnants of Sonic and Tails' presence can still be found in the final release. Mighty occupies the first slot in the character select screen, and his sprites are clearly based on Sonic sprites from the Crackers prototype, alongside some from Sonic CD. This would mean Mighty is a modified Sonic, explaining his placement as the first character. Wecknia is in the second character slot. This suggests the character is just leftover code from Tails that latched onto whatever moves and art assets the code was pointing at. This theory is all but proven by Prototype 0119. In this build, holding up and jump will make Wecknia float, which, while not animated, functions identically to Tails' flight. Although 2D Sonic games have their share of glitches, 3D Sonic games are more closely associated with bugs. The weak collision detection in Sonic Adventure lets players perform many tricks to access areas they aren't supposed to. In the Dreamcast version, the player can complete Sonic's final egg extremely quickly using a glitch. By charging up a light speed dash and then spin dashing off the ramp at the start, the player can clip out of bounds. If done correctly, they'll find an animal capsule, which ends the level. It's unknown why the capsule was left here, and it was removed in subsequent ports. The Sonic Adventure Bug Database is a collection of bug reports made by internal staff between 1998 and 1999, and has many entries after the game's 
Japanese release. The database is currently hosted online and illustrates some of the problems Sonic Adventure faced, a number of bugs or the game testers voicing concerns or suggesting content to be added. Some comments include suggesting a multiplayer mode in Twinkle Park, concerns about Tails following Sonic into the shower in Casinopolis, asking for the level Lost World to have a different name, perhaps to avoid association with the film, and even a suggestion that Sonic shouldn't be able to take a chow egg from a store, as it violated Sega's guidelines on encouraging antisocial behavior. Some testers also complained that the game had too many human characters. They asked that more animal characters be added, such as characters from Sonic the Fighters and Knuckles Chaotix. In Sonic Adventure 2, notes from testers can be found in the game itself. The mission descriptions for the test level read, First mission, make sure we debug this. Second mission, find 100 bugs. Third mission, find bugs that you couldn't find. And last mission, try bug zero. Despite the testers' determination, some bugs still made it into the final game. One of the series' most iconic sequences, the truck chase in City Escape, can be ruined if the player turns around and air dashes at the truck as soon as it appears. By dashing with precise timing, Sonic will intimidate the truck into reversing through the barrier, letting the player finish the level in peace. This glitch occurs because of a constant distance buffer between Sonic and the truck. If the player defies expectations and turns around at the right time, the truck ends up reversing to maintain the buffer. In the game's Chow Garden, the player has the option to sell their unwanted items for rings. The player's ring total is saved in the game's save slot, which is separate from the Chow Garden save slot. As the game's save slot updates before the Chow Garden save slot, by selling items at the Chow area and then quitting without saving, the player can update their ring total in-game without losing any items. Despite this being a fairly popular glitch, it was not fixed in any version of the game. The Chow Garden is associated with another glitch, known as the Chow Key glitch. If the player dies, there's a 75-frame window before the screen fades out, which can be useful for glitching. If the player dies as they complete the level, they will be sent back to the previous checkpoint in full control of their character as the result screen appears. If the player then collects the Chow Key right as the level ends, the game will wrong warp the character. Rather than send them to the Chow Garden as it normally would, it instead sends them to the test level. This glitch doesn't work on the Dreamcast version, but in versions with a 16 by 9 aspect ratio, it's possible to activate the glitch in other ways. If the player locks the camera at the right distance from the key as it's collected, it won't be able to reach the HUD to become a 2D image. The key will remain a 3D model, which will also activate the glitch once the level is completed. Ordinarily, this glitch will send the player to the test level, but it's possible to use it to reach other levels. By playing a best of 3 in multiplayer before activating the Chow Key glitch, the game will transport the player to the last level played in the best of 3. This way, levels can be played by characters they weren't designed for. It's theorized that the game has a value that tracks if a player came directly from one level into another without going through a menu, which can be done in a best of three or by using a chow key. When the player collects a chow key, this value is set to send them to the chow garden once the level ends. With the chow key glitch, this value is not updated, so it'll send the player to the last value entered. The test level is evidently a default value, so it sends the player there unless they overwrite it by playing the multiplayer. Sonic 06 is notoriously glitchy, with too many bugs to detail in this video. The game is so buggy, in fact, that one of Sonic's basic abilities wasn't programmed correctly. Sonic's custom powers were supposed to be limited by the action gauge at the bottom left of the screen. However, this was either never programmed, or the action gauge doesn't deplete due to a bug. This means Sonic can use his powers infinitely, completely breaking the game. It's also possible to finish Sonic's story early. By using the homing attack on an NPC, then talking to them, the the player can lure them away from their default position. By luring an NPC with an optional quest over to the water, the player can fall in the water while the text box is active. The player needs to hold the action button as they respawn, and the prompt will remain on screen while they move around freely. By entering a story mission and then accepting and completing the optional mission once inside, the game becomes confused. It tries to eject the player out of the mission, and since that isn't normally possible, the game boots the player to the credit sequence. Sonic Unleashed makes a tongue-in-cheek reference to Sonic 06's poor quality. In Eggman Land, there's three egg fighters with serial numbers referencing past Sonic games. EFMD1991 references the original Sonic on the Mega Drive, released in 1991. EFDC1998 is short for Dreamcast 1998, the console and year that Sonic Adventure was released. And EFXB2006, which means Xbox 2006 for Sonic 06. The last serial appears to be glitching. Unleashed wasn't without glitches, though. It's possible 
possible to exceed Sonic's typical top speed using M-speed or maximum speed and D-speed or directional speed. Both terms refer to the maximum speed Sonic can reach while traveling through the air, M-speed in 3D and D-speed in 2D. The glitch involves pushing the analog stick gently in a specific direction and then accelerating quickly. If the player performs this correctly and then jumps, Sonic will retain a lot more speed than he is supposed to. Skilled players use this trick to get out of bounds and skip huge chunks of the level. It's also possible to perform this glitch in Sonic Generations, although it's a lot trickier to pull off. In Sonic Boom Rise of Lyric, the player can pause while Knuckles is rising before a ground pound to reset the action. This allows them to use the ground pound again, rising slightly higher. They can continue to pause and ground pound to jump infinitely. This glitch, along with many others in the game, was fixed in a patch released in January 2015. The patch was 1 gigabyte, which was fairly large for the Wii U. The reason the patch was so large was because the level geometry and collision are stored in Steam files, which cannot be changed. Altering the tiniest bit of a stage meant replacing it entirely. Did you know? The final boss of Sonic the Hedgehog on Genesis has a glitch that makes him unbeatable. If the player lands the final blow on Robotnik, but then immediately hits him again before the piston reacts, it becomes impossible to finish the fight. The hit counter for the boss cannot go lower than zero, so hitting Robotnik twice in quick succession will cause the counter to roll back to its maximum value. This means that the player would have to land another 255 hits to win, which is impossible before the timer runs out. In sequences where developers did didn't want Robotnik to die, they would set his health to 255 points and make sure he wasn't on screen long enough to attack him hundreds of times. However, in Sonic 3 and Knuckles, it's possible to exploit glitches and beat Robotnik where developers didn't intend. In the Hidden Palace Zone, it's possible to break a cutscene by panning the camera up, then using Tails to keep Super Sonic off the ground while fighting Knuckles. This will keep the camera high when the cutscene starts, somehow altering the next scene so that Knuckles never appears. Instead of fighting Knuckles, Robotnik will attack where Knuckles was supposed to be, and then stay still, allowing the player to hit him. Hitting Robotnik 255 times will bring his counter to zero, and he will burst into a flicky. If Sonic lands on spikes in Sonic 1 immediately after taking damage, his invincibility frames won't activate, and without rings, the player will immediately lose a life. While it's debatable whether or not this is a bug, it was changed in sequels as well as subsequent re-releases of the game. Although more of an oversight than a glitch, the mobile port of Sonic 2 also fixed the infamous spike-related mishap. Mystic Cave Zone Act 2 has a deep pit with spikes at the bottom. The pit is a beginner's trap, intended to kill the player if they rush into it. If the player has unlocked Super Sonic, the player is forced to wait minutes until their rings tick down to zero. The pit became something of a meme in the Sonic community, and was fixed in the 2013 mobile port by combining it with another fan-favorite talking point. It became the entrance to the Hidden Palace Zone, a level from the original release that gained a lot of attention in the community. There is a popular glitch in the classic games known as zipping. Normally, the collision detection in these games is programmed to prevent Sonic from entering walls. However, if the player manages to force Sonic into a wall, then pushes against that wall, the collision detection will shoot Sonic in the opposite direction at great speeds. This, in effect, makes Sonic zip across the level. With enough speed, it's possible to zip past the first pixel in a level. However, the game will read the player's X position as minus one, a location that does not exist, so it will instead position the player at the end of the level, the maximum possible value. This is known as level wrapping. It's also possible to wrap through certain levels vertically in Sonic 2, 3, and Knuckles. If the player pans the camera to its lowest point and then jumps, the game will scroll the screen down to find the player. Collision detection isn't loaded for off-screen objects, however, so Sonic will fall during this glitch, passing through geometry, enemies, and and kill planes. This glitch will only work in levels that have long vertical shafts, which wrap endlessly to make the pits appear larger than the game can make them. Normally, Sonic's position is tracked to the top left corner of the map. However, this point doesn't exist in an infinitely looping level, so the left corner of the screen is used instead. When the player pans the camera down and jumps, it will read Sonic's vertical Y position as minus one and try to move the camera down to him, similar to the zipping glitch. The Genesis version of Sonic 3D Blast had a secret where the player could wiggle or tap the cartridge to access a level select menu. This is actually a result of the game crashing, and ironically only occurs because of Sega's strict quality assurance. The company would subject each game to rigorous tests so that they would never crash after purchase. This could often take weeks, and a 
a developer would have to repeat the process if their game failed. To avoid this, programmer John Burton coded the game to display an error message when it crashed, giving him specific feedback on what went wrong and how to fix it. However, when submitting the game for testing, Burton changed the error messages to redirect to a secret level select. Catastrophic errors, including disconnecting the cartridge from the console by wiggling it, would now open a level select menu instead of an error message. Because the menu didn't seem like a glitch during the approval process, whoever was approving the game would just assume it was a secret. Burton's plan worked, and the game was approved. Sonic Adventure is notorious for its glitches and sequence breaks, many of which are the result of its poor collision detection. In the Lost World area, if the player restarts on a panel that allows Sonic to walk on walls, they will begin to fall horizontally rather than vertically when the last checkpoint is loaded. It's also possible to complete Tails' section of Windy Valley without touching the ground due to its vertical design. Tails only uses up energy while he is ascending, so the player can press jump to begin hovering and then just guide Tails down to the goal capsule. It's possible to clip Tails into Emerald Coast from the hub world, as well as Sonic's version of Speed Highway in the GameCube Director's Cut. However, it's impossible to complete both of these levels as they were not programmed for Tails. Using the Burger Shop statue in Station Square, it's also possible to clip characters through objects. Doing this allows Sonic to get the light speed dash early, and lets Knuckles also access Emerald Coast. In our last Sonic Glitches video, we covered an exploit in Sonic Adventure 2 where the player could get unlimited rings by selling items in the Chow Garden. However, this isn't the only Chow related glitch in the game. If the player stands at a precise distance from their Chow and drops an upgrade, the Chow stat will be increased but the item will not be consumed. The 2006 Sonic the Hedgehog game contains numerous game breaking bugs. Players can extend the distance of Silver's levitation by tapping the jump button repeatedly and can float indefinitely with E123 Omega by using a similar technique. It's it's also possible to lift Sonic into the sky by standing on top of an indestructible box and kicking it repeatedly to gain height. These tricks let players float almost indefinitely and reach areas they aren't supposed to. In Wave Ocean, going off a ramp early during the Mach Speed section can lead to Sonic falling short and landing on a bridge. This always results in a death as players take damage when they collide with objects and it's impossible to stop moving during these sections. Touching certain loops at the wrong angle will cause the player to be catapulted off instead of completing the loop. Additionally, loops don't have physics programmed and players can walk up them and stand upside down as if they were solid ground. Though this isn't normally possible, glitches allow for characters who aren't Sonic, Shadow or Silver to complete levels. Doing so reveals that they have fully functional victory animations and voice lines, implying that they once played a larger role in the game. Boss fights against Silver are notorious for their numerous glitches. If Silver catches Sonic or Shadow while they are near a wall, it's possible to create an inescapable loop. Silver will throw the player into the wall which causes them to lose rings. However, one ring will be collected unintentionally, and Silver will immediately freeze the player again. They will be caught in a loop of being frozen, thrown, and collecting their single ring until they either exit or restart in the main menu. Similarly, if Silver catches the character while they are in the air, he will throw them upwards until they hit the skybox and die. It's possible to skip the trigger to change between 2D and 3D sections in Unleashed, Colors and Generations, allowing the player to sequence break. Using this trick, it's possible to dip underwater and immediately resurface while in 3D in the Sonic Colors level Aquarium Park. It's not normally possible to go underwater here in 3D, so the game will act as if Sonic is submerged, allowing the player to jump infinitely. Using glitches like this, the player can access other acts in the same zone, because Sonic Colors will load every act's level geometry when entering a zone. However, it will only load items, enemies, and obstacles for the act the player entered. In Sonic Lost World, if a player jumps on top of a bumper in Frozen Factory Zone 3, the graphics would glitch out and display a harsh strobe effect. This ran the risk of causing seizures in some people, and was quickly fixed with a patch. However, it's possible to access the strobe using another exploit. If Sonic double jumps back onto a wall he's already climbing, he can then wall run indefinitely. In Desert Ruins Zone 4, the player can use this to stick to a wall through the tornado.
tornado, which will warp Sonic beyond the kill plane. This causes the strobe effect to begin. A short demo for Sonic Forces was released in Japan in October of 2017, which forced the player out of the level after only one minute. However, by pausing the game on the same frame that a quick time event was completed, the timer would freeze, allowing the player to finish the level. The full release of Sonic Forces also had several glitches. At the beginning of the first level, if the player presses the stomp button, Sonic will fall to his death. It was entirely possible for this to be the very first thing the players encountered in the game, and was quickly patched out. Additionally, if the player inputted a frame-perfect pause during the double boost intro, its animation would continue, but at a slower speed with the effect still active. This was also patched out of the game. There were numerous glitches and technical difficulties during the 25th anniversary stream that revealed both Sonic Forces and Sonic Mania. In particular, it was ridiculed for its audio issues, including a high-pitched whine in the background throughout much of the early stream. This hiccup was referenced in Sonic Mania, where an identical tone can be heard in the background after the player beats the boss in Studioopolis Act 2. Did you know? Zelda creator Shigeru Miyamoto has, at one time or another, had nightmares about game-breaking bugs in Zelda games. Though Miyamoto may understandably dread glitches in his games, other developers look at them more fondly. When Ocarina of Time was being remade in 3D, several of the game's developers wanted to leave in glitches and oversights from the N64 original. Ocarina of Time 3D's programming director Shun Modia said, One conflict arose when, as programmers, we wanted to get rid of bugs. But the staff members who had played the old game said bugs were fun. We were like, what? It wouldn't be fun if your friends couldn't say, do you know about this? So we left them in if they didn't cause any trouble and were beneficial. Although many mistakes went untouched to preserve the spirit of the original game, some harmful bugs were fixed. One example of this is the Deku Nuts upgrade glitch found in the N64 version. If Link enters the forest stage beneath the Lost Woods wearing the Mask of Truth, some Deku Scrubs will upgrade the capacity of his Deku Nuts to 30. However, if the player receives the Poacher's Saw from Fado, the Deku Nuts upgrade becomes unobtainable. The game will set flags when events take place so it can mark and keep track of what the player has done. It's believed the Poacher's Saw sets two internal flags when it's collected instead of just one. The second flag is set at the location for the Deku Nut upgrade and so the game thinks the player has already obtained the upgrade and it disappears. The game has other internal values that can be manipulated in unintended ways. A technique known as wrong warping is often used in speedruns. It glitches the game allowing players to reach locations in ways that aren't normally allowed. Ocarina of Time organizes its various scenes and areas on a table of values, and each separate version of a location is assigned a four-digit value. This value is affected by things like the time of day and whether Link is a child or an adult. For example, if Adult Link enters Hyrule Market at night, the game will call on the default value for the town, then add values for Link being an adult, and then another for it being nighttime. This would cause the game to load the ruined version of Hyrule Market at night. When the player uses the blue warp after defeating a boss, the warp will trigger a cutscene. The game decides what scene to load by checking the value of the dungeon entrance and then adding a set value to it. If the player leaves the room through a different exit while the warp is active, however, the cutscene offset value will be added to the room the player is entering and the game will load an entirely different scene. This glitch can be exploited in the Great Deku Tree dungeon with incredible results. If the blue warp in the boss room is active, leaving the boss room will take the player straight to the Ganon's Tower collapse sequence at the end of the game. Wrong warping played a huge part in lowering the game's world record time below 24 minutes, and now it's lower than 18 minutes. Performing this glitch requires a bottle containing fish or bugs. If the player uses the bottle while Link is falling or backflipping, the game will queue up a cutscene for the item Link is holding and set it to play where he lands. If Link then uses another item before landing, the game will try to play a cutscene with that item instead. Items with no associated cutscene, like the sword, make the game revert to the default cutscene scene which is playing the ocarina. By cancelling out of the ocarina animation on the correct frame while on the edge of the blue warp, the player can move around with the warp still active. Getting a bottle before fighting Goma is easier said than done. 
It used to be that speedrunners had to escape Kakuri Forest by clipping past the entrance to Zora's River in the Lost Woods. Then they could get the bottle from the Cuckoo Lady in Kakariko Village. However, a new glitch was discovered in 2015 that allows players to create a bottle within the Great Deku Tree itself. Performing this glitch is tricky. The player must pick up an item they've never used before, like a Deku Nut, during a brief camera change that occurs when they exit a crawl space. And then they need to get hit by an enemy as this plays out. The game will bring up the text describing the item, but won't lock Link's movement. Because collecting the item was interrupted, the game hasn't defined and added the item to Link's inventory. This means the value that defines what the item actually is can be manipulated before Link acquires it. One way to change the item's value is by moving in front of an unopened treasure chest. Normal play resumes when Link swims in water and the game will give Link an item based on whatever value is currently stored. This effectively lets players turn the item into a completely different object. There's a chest in the Deku tree that contains a map for the dungeon and walking in front of it changes Deku Nut's value so that Link receives a bottle full of blue potion when he lands in the water. Another long time staple of Ocarina of Time speedruns is the infinite sword glitch or IS. G. If the player interrupts a crouching stab attack with an A button interaction such as reading a sign or opening a chest, the game will keep the swinging sword's hitbox active. Anything that touches the sword in this state will take instant and repeated damage equal to the last attack Link performed, which is extremely useful against bosses and tough enemies. If Link is knocked back, swings his sword or does most other things that would normally interrupt an attack in this state, the glitch will end. ISG isn't just used to deal damage though. In a normal attack state, the player is halted at edges and cannot jump or fall off them. And the effect of this carries over to the infinite sword glitch. If the player is hit by a bomb blast while doing a backflip and holding R to shield, they'll float in midair, unable to fall. This trick known as bomb hovering has its uses in Ocarina of Time, but is hugely useful for sequence breaking in Majora's Mask. Bomb hovering in Majora's Mask can give the player access to places they wouldn't normally be able to reach, such as the areas behind the load zones in Clock Town. These places mostly just contain low-res images of the areas beyond the loading zone, creating the illusion that the world is connected. However, one of these areas at the north end of West Clock Town contains a fully functioning owl statue, which is meant to represent the owl statue in the next area. Activating the statue enables the player to use the Song of Soaring to fast travel around the game world. The statue was never intended to be used though, so it isn't indexed as a warp location. If no other owl statues have been activated, the game will have no active warp points, and the song will warp link to the default Song of Soaring map cursor position, which is Great Bay. This value can be changed, however. The cursor positions for the pause screen and the Song of Soaring map share the same data. This means the Song of Soaring's default map cursor position can be manipulated by moving the cursor on the pause screen map. The song's menu and the pause menu don't line up, however, so the player won't warp to the area they've selected on the pause menu. This is fairly useful, as usually the player can only warp to locations they've already been to besides Great Bay. If the player makes their way to Goron Village, for example, they can warp straight to the top of Stone Tower. Using a glitch in the Wind Waker, Link can actually swim faster than the King of Red Lions. If the player pulls out the Wind Waker while being forced off a ledge, Link will bring out the Wind Waker while falling. This is known as the Wind Waker Dive. If the player cancels out of using the Wind Waker three frames before hitting the ground, they'll still be using the Wind Waker when Link lands, but the game will act as though it's in the middle of normal gameplay. If the player brings up the Wind Waker again, the camera will lock in place, but Link will still be able to move around. Hopping into the water and Pressing up left or up right on the control stick will cause Link to rapidly rotate until the player lets go of that direction. As soon as they do, Link starts moving backwards with all the momentum built up from each turn. Since the game's programmers didn't plan on Link ever actually swimming backwards, the only limit on how fast he can super swim is his air supply, as it limits how long the player can charge up the swim. This technique can literally shoot Link across the entire game world in seconds, and even move him at such speed that he'll be inside areas before they've even lost. Loaded. The Hyrule field shown at the title screen of The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess is actually interactive. If you reset the game as Link is about to drown in quicksand or even fall into a bottomless pit, the code that tells Link to respawn will continue running in the background as the title screen loads. As a result, Link wakes up on the Elden Bridge with no music playing and no visible UI. 
Epona can be summoned using the grass here, but you'll have to walk a ways to actually reach her. None of the load zones in the field are present, meaning Link can explore the canyons beyond them and fall out of bounds. Falling in the field will cause the UI to reappear when Link respawns, and dying after this will initiate a glitched version of the fight with King Bulbin on Elden Bridge. If the player manages to defeat Bulbin, they'll be taken to an even buggier version of Kakariko Village. The village will be stuck in twilight even though Link is able to run around as a normal human. Link won't have any of his items however, and opening doors here will cause the game to crash, making it impossible to progress. If we jump back to the part of the glitch where the UI has just reappeared, it's possible to perform a different glitch. When Link originally came into the title screen area, the game loaded up a dummy file used by the real-time cutscene engine for Twilight Princess's intro. When the player saves the game, they're now saving it using this dummy file as a base. When the player reloads the file, Link will start in Farron Spring. This is because the dummy file is using the game's cutscene information to decide how the player starts, and the default cutscene location is in Farron Spring. Link will also have all the flagged equipment in the cutscene dummy file, such as the hero's clothes, the Orden sword, and the Hylian shield. The game will also think Epona has already been tamed, so the player can use her to acquire the iron boots earlier than usual. There's a very similar glitch in The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword. This title screen glitch even enables the player to warp around the game world, similar to the warping glitches in Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask. Did you know? It's possible to trigger a glitch in Breath of the Wild that spawns ice cream in the player's inventory. For currently unknown reasons, these ice cream cones will appear in the player's inventory with the name Elixir. They often have the properties of sneaky elixirs, but sometimes draw properties from other items. It's speculated that the game is pulling data from the wrong place when these items are created. This includes the ice cream image, which may have been a placeholder during the game's development. Another interesting glitch in Breath of the Wild can be found very early on and completely changes the game world. To perform the glitch, players must open a save file while outside the Great Plateau or in a shrine and go to a ledge. They must then press A to climb down and pause the game on the same frame, then go back to the title screen and start a new game. In this new save file, Link will die the moment he wakes up and spawn outside the Shrine of Resurrection. This also means that Link did not receive the Sheikah Slate. This glitch happens because some of the data from the last save file isn't cleared correctly meaning some information is carried from one save state to the next. Because the Sheikah Slate controls the world map and fast travel, leaving it behind limits what players can do in the game. The map won't be accessible, and the mini-map never appears. However, the game still acts as if the player has the slate in cutscenes, and when scanning terminals. The player can also use runes using the quick select menu. There's another less expected effect of the skip, time is frozen. The cutscene that plays after leaving the Shrine of Resurrection actually starts the in-game clock. This means things like the day and night cycle, as well as blood moons, are disabled. However, all these effects can be reversed if the player simply goes back into the shrine and gets the slate. The player can also launch themselves long distances at high speeds in Breath of the Wild. Stasis launching involves jumping in front of an object that's about to be launched by the stasis rune. Doing so will catapult Link at a high speed in the direction of the object. Pulling out the paraglider will even allow Link to maintain that speed. A variation on this technique known as a super launch, is executed by pulling out the paraglider on a lag frame. A lag frame is when a game's frame rate drops as it's trying to load or unload assets. This is easier to achieve if the player turns the camera towards an area filled with lots of objects. This will roughly double Link's speed, enabling him to travel much faster than he normally would. Another way to launch Link is to exit bullet time just as he bounces off a ragdolling enemy using the shield surf. Bullet time slows time down while Link lines up a shot in the air and exiting the state at the same time he bounces off a ragdolling enemy causes him to be launched at around 20 times faster than normal. This has something to do with the way the game calculates speed during slow motion, and exiting the state during this action causes Link to speed up disproportionately. Skipping parts of Zelda games has become a standard for speedrunners. One runner by the name of Sock Folder found a way to clear the 1.1 version of Zelda on Famicom in around 3 minutes. To perform this feat, the player must enter the names for all three files precisely 
precisely as shown. Then must enter the second dungeon to collect the magic flute and travel to the graveyard. They must then wait for 10 ghosts to spawn before playing the flute to enter the hidden staircase. This will teleport Link to a buggy version of the final screen where the player can meet Zelda and finish the game. This glitch works by exploiting the fact that the Legend of Zelda can normally only hold 11 sprites in any given situation. If another sprite tries to spawn, it'll be denied. That is unless the final sprite is the magic flute. By spawning the flute when 10 ghosts are on screen, the game has effectively loaded 12 sprites including Link. In order to load this final sprite, the game will mistakenly begin searching for free space outside of the 11 bytes allocated for sprites. The first available byte it finds upon scanning is for a ghost action state, which dictates the ghost's movement. As a result of overriding the ghost's behavior with a value that wasn't supposed to be there, the game will begin loading garbage data. This would ordinarily be useless or even harmful, but in this situation the game will eventually execute code from the name entry field. This code instructs the game to load the final room with Zelda inside. Another extraordinary skip can be found in The Wind Waker. The Barrier Skip is one of the Zelda series' most infamous glitches, partly because of how elusive it was. The barrier in question forms a cylinder around the submerged Hyrule Castle. Speedrunners spent years trying to break through this barrier, as it would put Ganon's castle in reach early on, and potentially cut two hours from a five-hour speedrun. Circumventing the wall using common glitches was ineffective, however which led to the barrier skip being called the Holy Grail of Zelda speedrunning. The Wind Waker speedrunning community even pulled a $1,200 bounty for whoever was able to perform the skip. YouTuber Gertana1 was the first person to find the barrier skip by slipping through an indent in the barrier. Many were skeptical until streamer Link Oscuro was able to replicate the glitch on stream. And all skepticism vanished when a consistent method of performing the glitch was discovered by YouTuber Gymnast86. To perform the reliable version of the glitch, the player would need to take damage from the barrier once, then pull the Wind Waker out on the final frame of being knocked down to get past the barrier's outer wall. Runners had known about this trick for some time, but the more difficult part was getting Link past the solid wall. By lining up at a specific angle, pulling out the grappling hook, and then walking backwards and into the barrier at a specific point, Link will move to the right, clearing the barrier. But with this solution came new problems for speedrunners. The game requires the hook shot to reach the final boss. As the player doesn't have the hook shot when they reach Hyrule Castle for the first time, they need to perform a very specific setup. Executing this requires fairies and a glitch known as zombie hovering, where Link must receive knockback and die while he's holding his sword. Pressing the A and B buttons while targeting will then cause Link to rise off the ground. The glitch occurs because there are a few frames after death where Link can perform a jump slash, and as he's constantly dying, he's able to continually perform a jump slash in mid-air. Surviving a zombie hover requires the player to heal Link before he lands. If Link touches the ground, he'll die. The glitch was more consistent and therefore more useful in the GameCube version, as the player could equip the Tingle Tuner and buy a potion before they landed. The Wii U version replaces the Tingle Tuner with the Tingle Bottle, meaning players would need a heart or a fairy to survive. While it's easier to perform this glitch on the GameCube, it's impossible to reach the speed necessary to perform the barrier skip. By placing a pot containing a fairy underneath the ledge in the Wii U version, resourceful speedrunners were able to figure out that Link could zombie hover and survive. This is because the fairy would fly upwards through the ledge, allowing Link to land on them after the hover. While many believed it would be impossible to perform a barrier skip in the GameCube version, a workaround was recently discovered. Through dynamic memory exhaustion, the barrier can be prevented from loading entirely. This is done by exploiting a glitch where dry firing arrows affects the memory being used. A video demonstrating the new glitch was posted by ZSR Zelda Speedruns on July 5th, 2019. Other boundary-breaking techniques can be found in A Link to the Past. If the player uses the magic mirror to travel from the light world to the dark world but they end up on an already occupied space, the game is programmed to immediately return them. But by slowly inching the return portal across a threshold on Death Mountain's bridge, it's possible for Link to spawn on top of a normally inaccessible ledge. Dropping down from the ledge allows Link to access parts of the map he wasn't supposed to reach yet. This can even be done before obtaining the Moon Pearl, 
meaning the player will be stuck as a rabbit. In the Japanese 1.0 version of the game, if the player uses a blue potion in the dark world on the same frame that they screen transition, they can use the bird to warp in the dark world. This isn't ordinarily possible. While the game will spawn Link in Hyrule, it still thinks he's in the dark world. Using the magic mirror again will spawn Link in Hyrule properly, where he can re-enter the portal to return to the dark world. Another glitch with some speedrunning application is the Kennel World glitch in Link's Awakening. By pushing towards the entrance to Madame Bow Wow's doghouse from above the fence to the top right, it's possible to glitch inside to a distorted world called Kennel World. The world's layout will change depending on how many enemies the player has killed. By killing a specific number of enemies, it's possible to pick a path through Kennel World and find the final boss chamber. This will let players complete the game in a very short amount of time. Another Link's Awakening glitch is known as Screen Warping. By pushing Select to bring up the map just as the player initiates a screen transition, they'll be warped to the same position one screen to the left. This allows the player to skip certain triggers, letting them take Marin or Bow Wow with them to places they shouldn't be able to. This glitch was patched out of the DX version for the Game Boy Color. The GameCube had some amazing titles like Super Mario Sunshine, Wind Waker, and Super Smash Bros. Melee. And although these are all great games, they all have something in common. Along with many other GameCube hits, they all have a ton of glitches. Some bugs were found quickly after the game's release, while others were discovered years later by hardcore fans intentionally trying to break the game. It's impossible for developers to patch up all the cracks that come along during development. So we're not throwing any shade on the developers here. We're just exploring some rather fascinating details that fans have discovered over the years. We'll most certainly be covering the aforementioned Melee, Sunshine, and Wind Waker, but first, we'll start with a look at a third-party game to demonstrate that, of course, it wouldn't just be Nintendo games that players have managed to completely bugger up. Although Resident Evil 4 has been ported to basically everything these days, it was once only playable on the good old cube. And this version of the game features a pretty unique glitch that makes a menace out of the sweet and innocent. During one segment of the game, the player is forced into playing as Ashley. While Leon may have a wide array of weaponry at his disposal, Ashley sadly must avoid combat altogether. That is, unless the player wishes to take advantage of an interesting glitch. By opening a door directly into one of the zealots who is attempting to capture the presidential daughter, it's possible to stun them, which opens a prompt for Ashley to perform one of Leon's signature moves, the suplex. This was of course entirely unintended and was likely an oversight by the game's developers, but it certainly shows Ashley's true strength in any case. The glitch is actually exclusive to the GameCube release of the game, having been redacted in all future ports. Another popular third-party title that many chose to play on the GameCube was Dragon Ball Z Budokai. Budokai is very fondly remembered as a fighting game, but that doesn't mean it's the most polished. Some funny visual glitches can be performed in the game when playing on the Cell Games Arena, which were clearly overlooked. Here, moving to the edge of the arena and performing a taunt can result in the character's leg bending in a clearly unintended manner. Another glitch which can actually lead to a competitive advantage during gameplay involves special attacks. By performing an ability against your opponent and simply pausing the game just before the attack lands, the move will deal a significantly increased amount of damage when the player unpauses and lands a blow. While many improvements were made with Budokai's sequel, Budokai 2, this title also had its fair share of glitches. Once again, the game introduces a special skill that can be used to give the player a strong advantage over their enemies. This time, however, it's played without a pause menu and is tied only to Cell or Android 17 and 18. The trick requires the player to perform a taunt at the exact moment in which the energy field attack is used. In doing so, the player will have managed to freeze all elements on screen, not just their opponents, but the scenery as well. No hyperbolic time chamber needed. The only method of undoing this frozen state is by giving the opponent a good seeing to. Probably one of the biggest games on the GameCube was an entirely different fighting game, the second entry in the Smash franchise, Melee. Most of you probably know a little about what we're going to talk about, but it seems that there's actually more to it than we initially let on in our first video about the Smash series. Daisy's trophy, quite notoriously, has a hidden third eye, only visible by manipulating the game's camera and looking under her hair. While this eye is creepy enough on its own, it isn't actually the whole truth when it comes to Daisy's increased optics. She actually has more, lots more. 
By extracting the model from the game and viewing it through a standard 3D application, it's possible to find that her head is actually covered in additional eyes. In-game, most of these extra eyes were left in, but made invisible by the developers. And the reason that the more recognized third eye can be seen is simply because the devs forgot to make that specific eye invisible. Another odd bit of behavior in Melee can be seen with Mr. Game & Watch and his ability to absorb projectile attacks. By using the Oil Panic attack to absorb three projectiles which are strong enough, such as three fully charged PK flashes, and then using the resulting attack against the character who is holding out their shield, not only will the enemy's shield be broken, but Mr. Game & Watch will find himself blasting off at an alarmingly fast speed. In most cases, by using this attack, the result is that Mr. Game & Watch will die by being flown off the stage, unless of course there is a wall to stop him. This is the reason that the glitch has become known as the Kamikaze glitch. Speaking of running into a wall at light speed, glitches are sometimes the means that the greatest fan accomplishments for a game can be achieved, such as the absolutely staggering speed of the world record for beating Luigi's Mansion. The only reason that the game has been beaten in such a short period of time is the result of a glitch which occurs when Luigi has defeated the first boss of the game. When being transported back into the mansion from the boss arena, it's possible to force Luigi behind a chest, which will then push him out of bounds of the stage. This means that he can navigate in the dark or above the ceilings of the mansion's corridors to find areas that otherwise would have been inaccessible, including, it turns out, the final room of the game. As you can imagine, the result of this simple glitch is the ability to skip what is essentially most of the game, but sometimes the results of glitches aren't quite so helpful. While Luigi's Mansion makes the game shorter, Pikmin has a glitch that can postpone completion by quite a while. This glitch isn't even all too uncommon of an occurrence, and as a result has led many players finding themselves in a very unfortunate situation. The main goal of Pikmin is to collect the various parts of Olimar's ship so that he can escape from the planet Pien. F 404. This sees him travel across the world to find many ship parts, including a piece known as the Libra ship part. As a result of how high up this piece of the ship is in the game's level, there's a chance a glitch can occur in which the ship piece will fall and through the game's physics, bounce in a way that will throw it out of bounds. Normally, it would simply respawn close to an area where it fell, but because of the extreme bounce that resulted in it falling out of bounds, it will instead just be impossible to obtain. One of the mechanics of Pikmin is that the ship pieces don't simply reset their position when an in-game day has progressed, as one might assume. So, the Libra will essentially be stuck flying around out of bounds. The only means to correct this glitch is for the player to reset their game without saving. If the player continues to play the game with this ship part clipped out of bounds, they are unable to obtain both the best or even simply the good ending of the game because the Libra is a mandatory part of the ship. Super Mario Sunshine has a pretty fascinating glitch that doesn't really do much at all besides from changing how the game looks. The invisible Delfino Plaza glitch lets players visit Delfino Plaza where all that can be seen is its occupants, flora, and a few other details. There are multiple ways of triggering the glitch, but the most well-known way of executing it is to use Flood's nozzle rocket at the entrance of the blue coin exchange hut and wait for the hut's insides to pop up, then immediately dive out of the room. Mario will then be falling down to the ocean, but will stop before he hits the water on an invisible plaza. This is actually the same Delfino plaza that Mario usually runs around on, but its geometry is not being rendered. Only the collision data and objects within it. The plaza is invisible because of how the game handles entering and leaving certain rooms. Many rooms in the game are actually bigger than the building that holds them. A little like the Doctor's TARDIS in Doctor Who. Obviously, this would defy physics. So, to get around this, developers used a system that warps Mario into a different area when he walks into a room. And in Delfino Plaza's case, the rooms are far above the map. When it appears that Mario just walked into a room, such as the blue coin room, he actually is being teleported high up by touching a warp object. And the same process is repeated when Mario leaves a room, only he's warped downwards. When Mario is warped, Delfino Plaza also stops being rendered. And the rendering doesn't resume until Mario uses the warp to return. So if the player bypasses that warp, they get to experience a Delfino Plaza with a near total lack of detail. If you want a bit more info on this glitch, you should check out Scrumpy's in-depth video on it.
Sometimes glitches can help those that want to run through a game as quickly as possible, but at other times, glitches can actually reveal a part of the game that otherwise would have never been discovered. This is the case for The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker, which holds a secret that would not be visible if not for a very simple oversight. It's believed that the only means of exposing this secret is by exploiting a glitch, in which the player must go to the bomb shop on Windfall Island. By equipping the Tingle Turner and trying to use it, but at the same instance opening the inventory and switching the Turner for a bomb, the player will find that they actually pull out a bomb instead of the tuner. This means that the player is actually able to throw bombs in an area that under normal conditions would not allow Link to do so. Because of this, the player will then be able to use this bomb to destroy crates behind the storekeeper, revealing that there are actually pigs stashed in these crates the entire time. Cheat codes are all a bit of fun really, but when it comes to online games, cheaters can truly be a massive hindrance to the experience of other people. So it's no surprise that some companies dedicate a lot of effort to curbing exploits. Grand Theft Auto V is a huge game and a huge hit, but GTA Online is perhaps one of the most successful online games of all time, at least when it comes to year-on-year -year revenue. Part of this revenue generation, of course, comes from microtransactions, particularly for in-game cash which the player can then spend on weapons, items, property, or cars. So when a particularly strong glitch was discovered by players relating to this in-game cash, cheaters learned very quickly you don't mess with a juggernaut like Rockstar. The apartment garage glitch lets GTA Online players purchase properties, then use some menu magic to dupe the game into giving them millions of in-game dollars for the same property. Since that's obviously against the rules of the game, Rockstar stepped in in handing out a punishment so quick and severe that it was actually quite shocking. Instead of simply deleting the money that the players hadn't properly earned, Rockstar went for the jugular and unleashed a wave of full account resets, wiping characters that players had been working on for years in an instant. It's one heck of a punishment, but clearly Rockstar wanted to make an example, and what an example it was. Maybe Rockstar weren't so happy that in-game money, which earns the company a stonking volume of real-world money, could be stolen from right under their noses. A bit like something from GTA. Starting in spring 1992, Squaresoft published a newsletter titled The Ogopogo Examiner, named after a monster that appeared in Final Fantasy IV. In the very first issue, Squaresoft addressed a glitch in certain copies of Final Fantasy IV. If the player were to go back and forth between doors 64 times, the game would glitch out or become unplayable. The Ogopogo Examiner wrote this off as the curse of extinction cast by the game's final boss, Zeromus. And it's time for this episode's random piece of trivia. Today, we're looking at the late 90s platformer Space Station Silicon Valley by DMA Design, a team that would later change names to Rockstar Studios. Each stage of the game has a collectible trophy awarded for completing a specific objective for any given stage. By collecting all of these trophies, the player is able to access a bonus level at the end of the game and attain a 100% completion rating. However, during one stage of the game, Fat Bear Mountain, the developers overlooked a glitch which prevents the player from collecting the trophy. This made the stage impossible to access if not for the existence of an action replay code or patch correcting the glitch. The Hyrule Warriors games had several glitches which gave advantages to players. One glitch allowed players to collect a lot of rupees. Another glitch caused characters to swap out movesets with each other. One possible piece of unused data can be accessed through this glitch. By putting Lana's moveset over Zelda's, players could hear Zelda sing her lullaby. It's unused by both Zelda and Lana and can only be accessed through the glitch. The Switch version featured a bug in the game's co-op mode. The terrain on the second player's screen would be loaded onto the first player's screen if the game was kept on for too long. Koei Tecmo would eventually fix this issue in an update to the game. The 3DS version is one of the few Nintendo 3DS titles to have the 3D view disabled during gameplay. This was because the console had difficulty running the game with a lot of enemies. Playing on the new 3DS allowed more enemies to be on the screen, making Hyrule Warriors All-Stars one of the few games to utilize the power difference between the standard 3DS and improved new 3DS. Bethesda are infamous for the numerous glitches in their games, including some pretty weird ones. Possibly one of the creepiest examples of this can be found in the Elder Scrolls Skyrim. Throughout the game, there are mannequins that can be used to hang up spare equipment. A number of players have experienced a glitch, which causes these models to adopt the NPC AI. This has led to some spooky moments, such as having the mannequin's gaze follow the player, and sometimes even freely walk around. 
Did you also know that Pokemon Yellow's Safari Zone has a small secret not found in any other version of Gen 1? Or that Splatoon has a secret Easter egg referencing Tupac and Biggie Smalls? Click the video on screen for an entire hour of Nintendo facts just like these.